Again, beginning in the 1870s, the idea of a clean government, free of corruption, is something that um, becomes too much of an, an unattainable ideal in politics for the most part anyway. Again, the Republican Party tries and tries again to tout itself as being the party that is moving uh, toward a 100% merit system, but not all of them end up supporting it. When Rutherford B. Hayes is elected to the presidency in 1876, uh, again, his, uh, his emergence into the office is something that is considered extremely controversial, even though he uh, touts himself as obnoxious to no one in the election, right? He seems like he's a an uncontroversial figure for the most part until it's revealed later on that his presidency uh, was determined by uh, defections from one political party to the other in exchange for what is essentially a gigantic political favor and that is ending reconstruction. Okay, um, So once that actually comes about he, he starts to gain in, in worse and worse odor with most of the rest of the country. Okay, um, Again he, he constantly tries to pitch himself as being anti-corruption but there is a large contingency of Republicans led by Roscoe Conkling in New York called the Stalwart Republicans. Okay? And Stalwart Republicans are more in support of Ulysses S. Grant and his type of policies. Okay? And as we saw with Grant's presidency, his administration was filled with corruption, filled with holes, um, filled with uh, the, the spoil system and patronage and so forth. And so Stalwart Republicans are looking to keep that status quo. Um, and Rutherford B. Hayes comes out more along the lines of the, what are called the half-breed Republicans. This is the, the opposite fracture of, of the stalwart Republicans. Half-breeds are led by James G. Blaine, a guy who is, uh, eventually becomes the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Um, he's from Maine. And the half-breeds are called half-breeds because they are half-loyal to Grant, right, uh, again, before Hayes is brought into the presidency, half-loyal to the, the type of status quo that Grant has created, and half-committed to reforming the spoils system. So again, they, they like everything that Grant has done except for the patronage system. Okay, so uh, individuals like Rutherford B. Hayes try to basically say we're gonna we're gonna try to find some way of getting rid of the spoils system. We're gonna instead of giving out political favors, you have to earn the position. You have to you know get it by the sweat of your brow instead of the favor of your friend. Um, and the government finally does actually establish a committee to investigate the idea of uh, in introducing a merit system to hire new government employees. Um, and in some cases, there is some political fallout to this. Um, Chester A. Arthur, for example, who eventually becomes president, ironically enough, at this point in time is the operator of the New York Customs House. And uh, because he has been found guilty of abusing the patronage system under Hayes' administration, uh, Arthur is actually fired from his position. Um, another thing that ends up getting Hayes in trouble too, not only just in the, the controversy of whether or not to uh, introduce um, you know, government reform and so forth, is that he vetoes what is called the Bland-Allison Act, and this would have actually gotten the working class more on his side because it would have circulated more money, it would have created inflation and farmers, and w the working class would have been able to pay off debts. But instead, he vetoes the bill, and it causes, um, causes a little bit more economic hardship uh, than perhaps he bargained for. And as a direct result, the Republican Party, now that they are kind of floundering in support, they end up turning against him, and in some cases they end up even siding with the Democratic Party. Okay, so it ends up having um, a, a complete uh, blowback effect on him. Uh, he's not able to, to gain all the support that he needs. And James Garfield, who is another future U.S. president, ends up uh, coming out and, ironically, he warns Hayes uh, – from making any kind of enemies within his own political party. Uh, and ironically, it's something that James Garfield himself eventually ends up doing, and it costs him his life. So this is a, a situation where you, you don't want to upset your own contingency, you don't want to upset your own political party, uh, and there's, there's really not really um, a, a winning scenario here because if you're if you are committed to civil service reform you are going to upset somebody if you are a member of the Republican Party and in that respect you or, uh, Hayes ends up losing uh, the uh, 
the nomination for a second term. Uh, people actually end up abandoning him pretty quickly because of how much upset he ends up creating, even though, ironically, he runs on the platform that he is obnoxious to no one. Grant wants to run for another term in office, but he doesn't want the, the struggle of campaigning, okay? and so he ends up kind of <laughs> putting himself out of the, the situation anyway, even though he does have support from stalwart Republicans. And instead, James Garfield is selected, uh, again, in a similar capacity to what Rutherford B. Hayes is. Uh, again, he's a compromised candidate. He is initially considered offensive to no one. Um, and amazingly enough, Chester A. Arthur is actually named the vice president to please the stalwart Republicans. Okay, so we have a president who is ostensibly somewhere in the middle, although he does eventually side with the half-breeds. And then we have a stalwart vice president. Okay, so again, kind of a political situation, not unlike what we see with Abraham Lincoln uh, and Andrew Johnson. Okay, and uh, unfortunately, the situation winds up uh, ending the exact same way that Lincoln and Johnson's presidencies end up leading. Um, as a side note, the, the Democrat that runs against them is a guy named Winfield Scott Hancock. Uh, he's a former Union general who served at Gettysburg. Um, and he is kind of like Garfield in that uh, on the surface they claim that he is some kind of you know un inoffensive candidate and so forth until it's revealed that he actually supports the disfranchisement of Southern blacks and absolutely doesn't like the 15th Amendment. So uh, he ends up kind of uh, already being kicked out of the race in that particular instance. Uh, unsurprisingly, at this point, because politics are so evenly divided, it's almost on a geographical sense with this particular election. Okay, The Republicans win all the northern states, Democrats win all the southern states. And Garfield, uh, even though he ostensibly supports civil rights for African Americans, he is the one who officially announces the end of Reconstruction in his inaugural speech. Uh, Hayes never did that, okay? even though Hayes was the one who actually um, actually was responsible for ending it. Okay? Uh, it. It took that long, I suppose. It took all throughout Hayes' presidency for federal troops to be removed from the South and for a lot of these um, Southern governments to overturn back to the Democrats. And Garfield is, again, the one who ends up not even following his own advice. Uh, you know, He warned Rutherford B. Hayes not to side with one particular faction or another, not to make enemies, and yet he himself does it anyway. He ends up siding with the half-breeds, which uh, in this case Ulysses S. Grant tries to basically remind him of his own advice, right? don't upset your own political party, anything could happen. And to make matters worse, he goes the extra mile and he takes the, the leader of the half-breeds and makes him the Secretary of State. Okay? So Secretary of State position and the Vice Presidency position are pretty close in terms of their influence, right? If you are a um, uh, president or if you are a, a Secretary of State, you have almost as much uh, of a chance of becoming president later on down the line as a former vice president does. And uh, elevating the, um, the half-breed uh, into this particular position and end up kind of supporting the half-breeds in general ends up getting him in the worst kind of trouble. Okay? And uh, it culminates with a particular stalwart Republican named Charles Guiteau who ends up uh, walking up to Garfield uh, with a revolver and shooting him in the chest. Okay? Shoots him uh, in July of 1881. And Garfield lingers on in extreme pain uh, because of uh, inept medical care uh, and doesn't die until September 19th. Okay? So he actually lives uh, for about two and a half more months before he actually succumbs to his wounds. And essentially he dies of sepsis. Okay? The, the bullet, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is actually, uh, I, I don't know if they ever actually end up removing it or not. I think it lodges itself perhaps between his ribs in some strange fashion and they can't get it out. So Garfield actually becomes the second president that we have now who has been assassinated. And again, it's a similar situation to, uh, to Lincoln, okay? uh, but in this case, it's uh, his own political party that ends up um, doing him in. And Guiteau's fate is uh, eventually decided a year later. He's eventually tried and hanged for murder.
Immediately after Garfield is assassinated, um, the Americans turn very quickly on the stalwart Republicans and begin blaming Roscoe Conkling, okay, the head of the, the stalwart Republicans. And they say that he is the one who incited so much outrage. He's the one who stirred the pot and got Guiteau to end up assassinating Garfield. And to make matters worse and to have this look as bad as it possibly can, now we have a vice president who is also a stalwart Republican, Chester Arthur. Okay. And Arthur, uh, of course, is already mistrusted for being uh, an individual who has abused the spoil system. Right? He's part of the political party who has been responsible, the faction of the political party who's been blamed for assassinating the president. And now he himself is entering into the presidency after this assassination has occurred. Okay? So all things look very, very bad for Arthur. Amazingly enough, though, Arthur actually fulfills the promises that his predecessors end up putting forth and that he actually does um, attack civil service reform and ends up um, creating the, uh, the Civil Service Commission in the United States. Okay? He never removes any, or any federal officer for any political reasons. And all of his cabinet appointments are made based on the merit system. In other words, he doesn't pick uh, supporters from the stalwart Republicans uh, or anything like that. He, he does it based on who is uh, responsible enough and who is qualified enough to do the job. And Chester A. Arthur remains a very mysterious and somewhat suspicious president because um, upon his death, his uh, primary directive in his will was for all of his political papers, all records, and all of his correspondence completely destroyed. He wanted them all burned. Okay? And as a direct result, we have no museum, we have no presidential library anywhere in the country dedicated to Chester A. Arthur because all records of his presidency, aside from ones that have been kept in the public sphere, have been destroyed. Okay? So again, this lends some level of credence to uh, suspicion surrounding Arthur. Right? Was he, in fact, uh, involved in Garfield's assassination? Right? Was this a, a political move? Was he trying to cover his tracks? Take from this what you will. Right? This is, it, it just does not look good, <laughs> no matter how you slice it. Um, and again, he's the only president who has ever done this, who has ever destroyed all of his records. Right? Just about every other presidency um, has been recorded or has some kind of museum or library somewhere in the country, except for Arthur. Um, and some of the other pieces of legislation that come out, again, uh, George Pendleton, who's a Democratic senator from Ohio, is the one who ends up kind of partnering with Chester Arthur to establish the Civil Service Commission. Okay? Um, and this is the first federal regulatory agency that makes sure that um, political corruption is not really um, allowed to continue very further. Okay? And now 15% of all government jobs are filled on the basis of some kind of competitive merit test. Okay? You have to make sure that these individuals are qualified to do the job instead of, again, just being related to somebody somehow. And any federal employee who is running for office is prohibited from receiving any political contributions from their fellow workers. Okay? So again, if you're getting um, support from your friends, right, they can pat you on the back, your hand, shake your hand, but they can't give you any money. Right to continue. And the Pendleton Act uh, is uh, kind of a, an extension of this. This is what uh, causes the federal government to finally increase its numbers uh, since the end of the Civil War. And we end up with five times the number of employees in 1901 as we did in 1871. Right? It increases to over a quarter of a million. So now we're finally getting the government up to snuff gradually to where it can catch up with big business and perhaps it can finally begin to exert a little bit more influence over big business instead of the other way around. And by 1890, one third of all government employees are women as well. By the time 1884 rolls around, Chester Arthur has only served one term in office. Right? He actually uh, gets in office in 1881 after Garfield is assassinated, but three years into the presidency, uh, he develops a kidney disease. And uh, it becomes obvious over time that the Republican Party looks at him and says, even though he might be a, a fairly decent president, we don't know if he's a sustainable one. Right? We don't know if this disease is going to end up killing him. We don't know if this is going to just make him sick and debilitated. We need a stronger candidate. And initially, the Republicans choose James Blaine, right? the guy who's the former Secretary of State. Uh, he was endorsed by Garfield. 
right, for this particular purpose. Um, and now, unfortunately, while Speaker of the House, Blaine is actually exposed for bribery. <laughs> okay, so again, uh, an individual who is a half breed, who is basically saying that we're trying to get rid of the spoil system, is now being accused of something as hypocritical as bribery. Again, it doesn't look good for the Republican Party. So now the stalwarts who have potentially assassinated a president and the half breeds who are hypocrites don't get a whole lot of support, right? Those two halves of the Republican Party now are uh, people in America are scratching their heads. Um, and anyone who is uh, trying to fracture even further off of the half-breeds and say that they don't like James Blaine is referred to as a mugwump by a New York newspaper. Mugwump is the Algonquin word for big chief. Okay? And even though this is considered a, a pejorative term at the time, right? it's basically saying you, know, you, you think you're, you're high and mighty and full of yourself because you are you know, somehow morally superior, that, right? you're actually trying to get rid of corruption. Uh, it becomes a, a term of endearment, and uh, the mugwumps actually establish themselves as a, a brief form of a, a third party in politics for a while. Um, and their their primary stance is for honest government, right? They're, they break away from the Republican Party altogether. And their, their entire idea here is to have a 100% merit system in government with no corruption whatsoever. And it tends to be individuals who are part of the middle class, who are intellectuals, who join up with the mugwumps, um, professors, editors, uh, authors of different kinds. Um, Mark Twain, for example, was a mugwump. And the Democratic Party takes this opportunity to push forth its own candidate in the form of Grover Cleveland. Okay? And Cleveland is another reform uh, individual, right? He is the mayor of Buffalo, New York for a while. Uh, he eventually becomes governor of New York and ends up fighting corruption in Tammany Hall. So it seems like he is fulfilling all the promises that the Republican Party cannot fulfill. And he doesn't like the idea of money expansion. Okay, This is one thing that doesn't necessarily endear him to um, the working class, right? He prefers free trade over tariffs, though, which does end up um, getting him a little bit of support, but uh, he is uh, eventually well known for not really doing much to, to help struggling working class individuals. Um, and to make matters worse, he has two big scandals that kind of haunt him uh, throughout his presidency and throughout his life, really. The first one is relatively minor in comparison to the other, but uh, during the Civil War, as a young man, he actually paid a substitute to fight in his stead for the Union Army. Okay? And this was, uh, again, not necessarily anything illegal, right? You had the opportunity to do this. He paid a, 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 a Middle European immigrant $150 to serve in his stead, and the man did survive the war. Um, but $150 is the equivalent of just a little over $3,100 today, right? So this was no small amount. So he has some kind of a, uh, an air of cowardice associated with him from the get-go. And the other thing that makes him such a, a controversial candidate, and the thing that's the most um, damaging to his reputation, is while he was a bachelor, he ended up having an illegitimate child with a widow named Maria Halpin. Halpin. Uh, and the problem with this too, I, I mean, again, during this time period, having an illegitimate child in, in any instance is considered to be extremely controversial, right? Morally uh, degrading and all that kind of stuff, at, at least in the eyes of the public. And especially if you are a politician, right? This is something that is still, even today, uh, an extremely controversial thing, especially with more uh, conservative crowds. And the, the thing that makes it even worse is eventually when Cleveland gets into politics, Halpin accuses Cleveland of actually raping her and of the relationship not being consensual. And Cleveland goes to the extent of having her completely institutionalized and having the child taken away from her and fostered by friends of his. And uh, he does actually support the child very quietly, right? Sends money on a regular basis to him and everything. But um, the uh, the widow Halpin actually ends up getting out of the uh, the mental hospital and ends up you know just causing havoc for him for the rest of his political career really um, so he, she ends up kind of just haunting him <laughs> for the remainder of his days and amazingly in the midst of all this in the midst of the the controversy surrounding him and everything uh, considering the alternative right with the the fractured uh, Republican Party. Grover Cleveland ends up winning the presidency by a very narrow margin. So this is the first time we've had a Democrat in the White House since Andrew Johnson. 
Okay, so and it's a it's a brief little hiccup in this pr little line of succession here, but um, but Cleveland is the the first Democrat in a while. And of course, immediately after he's put into office, right, uh, Cleveland is hounded by supporters of the patronage system, right? The Republican Party has been lousy with the patronage system for a long time, and individuals looking to get ahead in life, looking to get ahead in politics, constantly petition him to give them jobs. Okay? Um, and the Democratic Party is uh, kind of falling into the same um, pattern of corruption, really, that the, that the Republican Party is at this point. Uh, they you know get upset with him because he's not willing to give them jobs for supporting him and all that kind of stuff. And to make matters worse, he doesn't really ever follow through on his promises. Okay, any of his anti-corruption efforts end up being completely ineffective. Okay, during the period of his uh, first term in office, two thirds of all federal jobs are given to Democrats through the patronage system. Okay, so it's uh, there's there's still rampant corruption in politics, no matter what political party is involved. And the other thing that makes it worse too is that um, Cleveland is essentially a do nothing president. Okay, his motto in all this is essentially to do as little as possible. Uh, he ends up vetoing over 400 acts of Congress. Right, virtually no new legislation gets passed throughout his presidency. And that particular statistic is more than twice as many as all previous presidents combined. Okay, so um, he is one who essentially grinds politics to a screeching halt during his presidency, right? Um, and it's something that doesn't really – he doesn't benefit the, the Democrats or the Republicans in any real way. Um, the thing that ends up getting him um, you know, in, in bad – state with the, the working class it happens in 1887 because uh, in the South we end up in a drought, okay? And in Texas in particular, farmers begin to suffer from this drought, right? Their crops are not growing, um, and they try to actually petition the federal government and Cleveland in particular to send them some money to help them out. And Cleveland flat out says no. He says uh, even though people should support the government, government has no responsibility to support its people. Okay, so he's he's going back to kind of the uh, the Andrew Johnson form of, of the Democratic Party here, in that he is not willing to allow the federal government to really take part in people's lives. And the only real commitment that he makes to any kind of government intervention during his first term is some kind of railroad regulation. Um, he tries to get Congress to adopt any federal regulations on interstate railroad fees, just to make sure that uh, no uh, company is really gaining any uh, more um, benefit over another and to make sure that the, the government is the one who is actually gaining the benefit and not the businesses themselves. Uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission is created uh, and I've got this as the first regulatory agency along with the, uh, the Civil Service Commission. Civil Service Commission is the first federal regulatory agency. This is just a little bit of an error here. Um, but this is the first regulatory agency that regulates businesses in the United States. I should put it that way. And unfortunately because Corruption is so rampant in politics because no one is really paying attention. No one is really doing what they say they're going to do. Um, most of the policies are ignored anyway. Okay? The railroad companies involved are extremely corrupt. Uh, they're in bed with most local politicians, and so there's not really much of a, um, a motivation to, to have this uh, have any kind of impact. When we get to the election of 1888, um, Grover Cleveland has already started to draw more attention to the fact that the government surplus that has been garnered from tariffs uh, is, uh, is something that we need to take a stronger look at. Uh, the fact that all of these tariffs that have been put in place to prevent foreign competition from happening uh, ends up um, – again, it comes down in, in a bad way with, with Texans during the same year here because he says we have a lot of money. He says it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. He says, um, but we're we're not willing to give it out to to individuals who actually need it in the United States. Okay, so again, it's not really a, a good thing for him to do this. But he indicates essentially that these these rates are too high. It's a burden on the poor. Again, ironically, he says it's a burden on the poor, even though he's not willing to give any of that money to the poor. And he thinks that uh, if we're going to allow the poor to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, the only way for this to happen is for them to be able to uh, have a more competitive role in the American marketplace. 
and that is they have to be able to do business with foreign companies. Okay? Uh, if you are a farmer during this period and you're trying to sell whatever crop you're growing at market, you're already in competition with industrial farms that are charging less for the same product. Okay? So if you are trying to sell something overseas, right, then you might have a better chance of gaining a little bit more money. So he's trying to open another door with one hand while with the other hand very firmly grasping the bag of money he's not willing to hand out. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's not a great political situation for him. Um, the Republicans start to uh, harken back to what they consider to be the good old days again here, and they say that they are going to start using uh, the moniker Grand Old Party, the GOP, and this is when this first starts getting used, and you still hear the Republican Party referred to as GOP today. Okay. And their nominee is a guy named Benjamin Harrison, and his only real claim to fame, his only reason that people would want to elect him is that he is the grandson of former President William Henry Harrison. Okay? And if you recall from 1301, William Henry Harrison's only claim to fame is being the first president to die in office. Okay? <laughs> um, William Henry Harrison was elected to the presidency um, way back in the, uh, in the 1840s, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he is elected to the presidency, gives a speech in a driving rainstorm, gives his first, his inaugural speech in a driving rainstorm, contracts pneumonia, and dies one month after he's put into office. Okay, so nothing gets done. Okay, and so now his grandson is being put into office, and people suddenly have some sense of nostalgia, even though his grandfather really didn't do anything. <laughs> okay, um, the thing that does make him important, though, is he comes from Indiana, which is a pivotal state. Okay, it's one of these swing states that we're talking about. Okay, one of the states that ends up determining who actually wins an election. But again, he doesn't really have much of a political career to speak of. He served one term in the Senate, and that's it. And because of all the, the distaste for by the working class against Grover Cleveland and uh, maybe you know some of the, the scandals that are constantly hounding him and so forth, Benjamin Harrison ends up winning by a very, very slim margin, carrying New York as his uh, swing state. Um, and in the aftermath of that, one particular Republican boss from Pennsylvania named Matthew Quay ends up distributing most of the campaign money that Harrison has collected uh, to different key states in whom they want support, and he starts promising government jobs to loyalists again. Okay, so we're right back to the spoil system again, right? Not making any kind of effort to conceal it. And as a direct result, the Republicans end up gaining control of the Senate as well as the presidency. Okay, so it uh, seems like the Republicans have a pretty firm grasp on politics now. Um, under Harrison, again, we go back to a, a constant wave of, uh, of spoil system and constant patronage again. Um, for one thing, he signs what's called the Dependent Pension Act. This is a literal federal act that gives Civil War veterans uh, more pay for voting for him, essentially. So if you are a Civil War veteran and you're still around, right, you know, however many years now it's been since the end of the Civil War, okay, uh, if you have voted for Benjamin Harrison, you get a little bit of a stipend. You are literally being paid for your vote. And Union veterans and their family members, those who have survived, end up receiving nearly twice the amount of money they had before over the course of the next four years. Okay, so this is a, um, a, a big impetus for keeping him in office. He's buying votes. And at the same time, too, we have uh, senators who are trying to pass anti-corruption laws. Okay, so John Sherman from Ohio tries to pass the Sherman Antitrust Act. Okay, and what this does is it prevents corporations from receiving monopolies in the United States. So it uh, prevents individuals like Carnegie and Rockefeller from being able to control 100% of uh, of the the business that they're involved in in the United States. Problem is, is this only goes so far, and it doesn't really get uh, a whole lot of support, right? It's not enforced very often. Okay, only 18 lawsuits are filed using the Sherman Antitrust Act between 1890 and 1901. Okay, and as a result, it's referred to in some cases as the Swiss Cheese Act because it's so full of holes, right? It's so easy for people to exercise these loopholes and get around them and get what they want anyway. Uh, Sherman also tries to pass a Silver Purchase Act, right, because he's starting to get a lot more um, support for silver coinage in the United States instead of gold coins. Okay, uh, Gold supply is starting to dry up gradually in the United States now that people have 
uh, sent you know prospectors and big businesses out to California and those areas. There's still a lot of silver though, but it's not as economically viable. And so people are trying to basically switch from a gold standard to a silver standard in some cases. And it ends up deciding uh, in part the, um, the, the temperature of future elections in the late 1890s. Uh, but the Silver Purchase Act requires the Treasury to start purchasing four and a half million ounces of silver each month from these different mines out west to try to convert them into coins. Okay, so again, he's trying to move legislation in a different direction. Uh, it never quite comes to uh, fruition, though, in the way that he wants. And in many ways, it ends up fostering the financial crisis that ensues in 1893. Um, William McKinley, who is a representative from Ohio, sponsors what's called the McKinley Tariff Act in 1890, and this is what gets him more into the spotlight. McKinley himself eventually becomes president. Um, but he starts raising more taxes on imported goods to the highest level possible, and he adds agricultural products to the list. So he's basically trying to undo everything that Grover Cleveland tried to do. Okay, so he. Uh, uh, eventually, he ends up losing his seat in the November elections uh, because the Democrats take control of the House. But he is basically saying that if we're going to uh, keep the Republican Party in um, in power here, then we need to have strong tariffs, right? We need to continue to produce everything in-house, make American businesses the ones to receive all the money, and you know whatever happens to the working class who are trying to fend for themselves, they have to fend for themselves. That's it. And the Republican majority in the Senate in the November 18, 1890 election is reduced to only four people. Okay, so the Democrats have a very sweeping majority in the House, in the House at this point, and in the Senate as well. And now in 1892, we start to see more and more of a presence of third-party politics, um, and the vast majority of people who actually take part in the 1892 election um, have a large voice uh, involved in third parties. Okay. Uh, the Independent Party is actually founded in 1890 by several different working class members who are farmers, miners, railroad workers, uh, all in Colorado in particular. Uh, and eventually this little movement ends up filtering down into the South, and there's a lot of Democrats in the South who are so overwhelmed by this particular support, um, mostly because there are so many farmers in the South who end up joining this particular contingency, that the Democrats, in order to be able to have a, a presence in politics, they actually have to elect representatives who support the position of the independent party. And so individuals who are uh, eventually considered something of troublemakers are, are guys like Thomas Watson, who's a, an alliance leader from Georgia, and he specifically tells southern farmers, both black and white, to join forces against the white elite and try to get rid of them. Right? He's saying these people are the source of all your economic woes, Right with the crop lien system and sharecropping and all that kind of stuff. Um, we have Mary Elizabeth Lease, who's one of Kansas's first female attorneys. Okay, remember women were not usually attorneys during this point. Uh, she becomes one of the first, but she becomes kind of the the figurehead for the farm protest movement. She says that Wall Street is really the source of all the farmers' woes. Right, that uh, Wall Street is not willing to. Um, reduce tariffs and so people are not able to sell their wares on a world market anymore, right? They're still having to sell stuff in the United States and so Wall Street is the one responsible here. And she says uh, she wants to abolish loan sharking in banks as well. Uh, she says that um, the loan sharks are also in bed with, uh, with Wall Street and big business. She says the uh, if you are trying to you know, get a loan for uh, a plow or something like that, again, you might be charged an outrageous amount of interest for it. And if it breaks, then you're really in trouble. Uh, the People's Party, which has been nicknamed the Populists, uh, is formed in 1892 by a lot of alliance leaders in Omaha, Nebraska. And the Populists, again, as I said before, are really interested in getting silver coinage uh, to replace gold coins in the United States as the primary source of currency. Okay. Uh, again, we still have greenbacks that are in uh, society. We still have gold coins being used here too, uh, but they want silver coins to replace it because there is um, a, a much larger presence of silver mines and silver loads in the United States than there is gold. But again, silver is not as economically viable as gold. It's not worth as much. Okay. Uh, so it would have to change the, the economy in, in some way to do that. 
Um, they also want a salary-based income tax, okay, because they don't want to have to everybody pay taxes at the same rate, right? We still have a lot of wage disparities in the United States, and people are having to, in some cases, pay the same amount of taxes. Uh, they also want federal ownership of the railroads so that these railroad companies are not really, you know, messing people up and taking advantage of them so much. They also want an eight-hour workday and new immigration laws, okay? Uh, and the eight-hour workday is pretty typical of any of the labor unions during the time. The immigration law, again, tends to cater to white middle class work or white working class workers, um, specifically because of kind of the, the nativist temperature of the day. Uh, again, a lot of movements against um, immigration in the United States because they are quote unquote taking our jobs. Okay, and so uh, it's, it's not exactly inclusive. It doesn't include the entire working class. Again, it's usually white working class males. And uh, Iowa has a, a candidate named James Baird Weaver who uh, becomes the populist candidate. And Weaver is actually uh, morphs himself out of the Greenback Party because he used to be the leader for, for that particular third party. Uh, and the populists, like I said before, also end up absorbing a lot of uh, former Greenbackers because, again, they support the, the same amount of uh, inflation, right? the same principle here. So they want more money to be put into society so that the working class can pay off their debts. And Grover Cleveland is renominated by the Democratic Party, and Benjamin Harrison is renominated as the two major, major party candidates here. And the Republicans and Democrats have a, an almost exactly the same uh, amount of popular votes, five million each, roughly. Okay? Um, but Cleveland is the one who wins the Electoral College. And so for the first time before or since, this has never happened before or since, um, Grover Cleveland wins a second term as president, but in a non-consecutive way. Okay? All other presidents who have served two terms have served them back to back. Okay, but Cleveland actually has a president who serves a term um, in the middle, and then he serves another term afterward. So uh, it's, a, it's a very rare instance and really speaks more to the, the evenly divided politics in the country at the time. Um, the thing that makes the, the third party candidate so uh, important here is that James Baird Weaver wins one million popular votes compared to the five million in each party. And one million popular votes is a lot. Uh, and for, for this particular time period, considering how many people actually do vote in the United States. He wins one-tenth of all votes. Uh, and he actually ends up completely carrying four different states, uh, Colorado, Kansas, Nevada, and Idaho. Okay, so several different states are starting to support third-party politics more than they are even the other two parties. Uh, Alabama, for instance, also has 37% popular uh, populist votes in it. After Grover Cleveland is elected to the presidency, he ends up inheriting the beginning of a, the worst economic depression in history, uh, leading all the way up to the Great Depression. Okay? Um, Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, which is one of the biggest railroad companies in the U.S., ends up declaring bankruptcy. Okay? And it leads to this domino effect because all these other overextended railroads in the United States uh, are suddenly starting to go bankrupt, and the banks that are... Uh, you know, being kept afloat basically uh, from from the loans and from the business that they're doing with these railroads also start to go under. Okay, and so as a result of these big companies going under, 600 banks end up closing, and as a result of the banks closing, individual small businesses, 1,500 of them, end up failing because they have been doing business with the banks. So again, it's a chain reaction from the top down. Um, and finally, Europe looks at America and says, we're going to withdraw most of our investments now. Okay? We're going to essentially leave America to do what it needs to do. Right? There's no reason for them to do business with America because there are so many high tariffs in place already. Okay? America has basically um, you know, cut the legs out from under Europe in terms of its ability to do business. Uh, and so Europe really doesn't have a whole lot of uh, impetus to do business now. One fourth of all unskilled workers are unemployed as well. Okay, so again, this is uh, this is no small thing, especially for the time period. And the depression lasts for five years; it goes all the way until 1898. Okay? We end up with a 20 percent unemployment rate at its highest. Uh, and to make matters worse, even though um, Sherman tries to put forth the Silver Purchase Act, tries to get 
more inflation put into society to balance things out, right? Turn it over to silver coins instead of gold coins. Um, Cleveland decides against it. He says we're going to return America to a gold standard because that's what we've always done, and it ends up worsening the depression. Okay, so now there's less money going around. Eight, by 1894, we have 750,000 union workers who go on strike in the United States, right? Things grind to a halt very quickly. And the Republicans retaliate by referring to the populists and individuals who are, who are stirring up all this trouble from the working class level as tramps and hayseed socialists, okay? Uh, so politics are starting to become a little bit more bitter now. Um, and in 1894, the congressional elections come around, and the Democrats get kind of swept out the door. Okay, so now Senate and House of Representatives are dominated by the Republican Party. Okay, and Grover Cleveland is kind of the last man standing, right, in in the face of uh, Republican um, uh, pushback. 118 Republicans gain seats in the House. We have six populist senators and seven congressmen. So even the populist party is starting to become so so popular, quite frankly, now that they are actually gaining uh, major seats in uh, in Congress as well. The big problem that we have with the Sherman Silver Purchase Act is that there is a lot of division among Democrats as to whether or not this should have been allowed to continue or whether Cleveland was justified in returning us to a gold standard. Okay, So the, the gold versus silver um, struggle here is something that happens toward the end of the 19th century. What the populists decide to do is because they are starting to gain so much traction in politics, they see this as an opportunity. Okay. They say that when the next election comes around, what they are going to do is they are going to look at individuals who are pro-silver, right, from the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and they're going to try to act as a safety net and bring them over to the populist side instead, okay? Because most of the Democrats and the Republicans are, um, they're both fighting for a gold standard to continue. And so what the populists decide to do is when the presidential elections come around and these, um, these national conventions for the Republican and Democratic parties happen, the populists decide they're going to hold their own national convention after these two major party conventions happen. Okay? So that way when the Republican and Democrat supporters of silver end up storming out of the conventions in disgust, they will go to the populist convention and perhaps give them some support. So it's a pretty ingenious way that they do this. Republicans turn to William McKinley for his pro-gold standard platform. Okay, uh, McKinley is kind of towing the party line, doing everything that the Re Republican Party expects a candidate to do. And there is a small contingency of silver Republicans led by a guy named Henry Teller, okay, who, just like the populists expect, ends up storming out of the convention in disgust because he doesn't get the nomination. Okay? Republicans are not willing to really um, entertain the idea of having silver as a standard. And the Democrats, on the other hand, end up having uh, most of their supporters be pro-silver. Okay? Most of their delegates are rural delegates who support the working class, who support pro-silver. Okay? Um, and the Democrats who are in support of a gold standard are referred to as gold bugs or gold Democrats. Okay? Um, and the, the congressman from Nebraska named William Jennings Bryan becomes the guy who ends up uh, gaining actually most of the support for not just the Democratic Party, but also for a lot of populists as well. Okay? And the, uh, the populists and Democrats who support silver are called the Silverites. Okay? So this is when you talk about silver rights and gold bugs. We're referring specifically to um, the, the Democratic Party and how it's already fractured. And Brian specifically targets the Republicans as being greedy financial magnets. He says that they're nothing but slavers. Um, and he is actually chosen uh, for the Democratic nomination on the fifth ballot, specifically after he gives a speech called the Cross of Gold. Okay? And William Jennings Bryan is a preacher. I mean, he's an evangelical minister. Right? He knows how to, uh, to ramp up a crowd. He knows how to get them on his side. Uh, and so the speech that he gives specifically says that the Republicans worship at the feet of the cross of gold. He says that they, that's all they want. Is they, they're looking for money. They're looking to line their own pockets. They're corrupt. Um, and he just tries to gain as much support as he can based on that. There is another um, a small amount of supporters who end up uh, – 
you know, supporting Grover Cleveland's policies. They leave and they nominate John Palmer, who is a pro gold standard guy. But uh, like Henry Teller, they don't uh, they don't really make much of a difference in this case, right? It comes down to McKinley and Bryan. And the populists ultimately come into the Democratic Party instead of what they expected would be the opposite way. Okay, so uh, populists and the Democrats start to back William Jennings Bryan here. And in the election of 1896, we begin to see the first stages of the depolarization of political parties in America. Okay, we've already seen that the uh, the Republican Party from the beginning of the Civil War until this point has been the more progressive party. Okay, Republicans have kind of fallen into corruption now that we've talked about all the big business and stuff going on. The Democrats, though, in this particular case, are starting to return back a little bit to this Jacksonian idea of, dem of the Democratic Party, okay? Uh, campaigning specifically to the working class, okay? And in this case, Bryan takes a, a kind of a moralistic stance, okay? He's the first moralist candidate, I guess you could say, uh, for the Democrats, at, at least at this point. He pitches things in a moral sense. And he says we need to campaign for those who are poor and oppressed. Okay. And this is what leads the Democratic Party to eventually become a party that focuses so much on social justice and liberal reform and that kind of thing, right? Most of what we know it to be today. Um, and so this is kind of the first iteration of that. Again, before now, the Democratic Party has been associated, again, with all the negative aspects of slavery, the Civil War, secession, and all that kind of stuff, uh, the Ku Klux Klan and all that. And now it's starting to kind of gradually turn into a different direction. Okay, so again, it's not a it's not an overnight thing that suddenly one day Democrats wake up and they changed and become something different, but it's a, a slow, gradual process, and this is just the first stage of it. And again, Brian is a minister, right? He goes up there and he starts, you know, he starts preaching, right? He starts getting everybody riled up, uses a lot of evangelical imagery, basically says the world is going to hell in a handbasket if McKinley gets elected. Um, and again, he is the first leader of a major political party that calls on the federal government to help the working class, right, to provide some sense of welfare for them. And he goes on a whistle-stop campaign, travels 18,000 miles on a train, visits 26 states, 250 cities and towns. Um, and ironically, even though he says that he is campaigning for the poor and the oppressed, his rallies are for whites only. Okay, so again, no irony lost here. Um, and he further alienates the working class, uh, specifically in the North, by uh, alienating Catholics in particular, because again, Catholics don't necessarily respond in the same way to an evangelical minister as Southern evangelicals would. And he also supports alcohol prohibition, okay, which is something else that uh, uh, Northern Catholics, um, uh, the, the Irish contingency, the German contingency, a lot of immigrants uh, are not supportive of either. Okay, so his his push for this uh, entire prohibition is something that people are not willing to come on board with. McKinley, though, does the exact opposite of what Bryan does. He conducts what is referred to as a front porch campaign. Instead of actually going out and meeting people, he invites them to come and see him instead. Okay, Advice them specifically to his home in Canton, Ohio. Okay, And so he starts presenting all these prepared statements to the press, basically saying that William Jennings Bryan is a demagogue. Right, He's nothing but a, a fraud, right? A, a preacher who's trying to get everybody riled up and all this kind of stuff. Um, and McKinley actually ends up sending his own delegates out, 1,400 speakers to speak for him. Right? He, he doesn't put forth the work. He gets everybody else to do it for him. Um, and in the end, William Jennings Bryan gets 6.5 million votes, and McKinley gets 7.1 million. Okay? So McKinley just edges out Bryan by a pretty slim margin. Okay? And McKinley eventually wins the Electoral College, too, 271 to 176. Um, and the, the Midwest vote is what Brian ends up losing out on. Okay? If, he, um, if he hadn't you know, alienated certain contingencies along the way, he might have gained that support. But again, his campaign changes the Democratic Party's face, right? turns it away from um, the, uh, the pro-business conservatism that it's tried to tout from the end of Reconstruction into some sense of liberal reform. Okay? And that's what it ends up... Uh, taking on, especially once we get into the 20th century and we start seeing 
Um, presidents like uh, FDR, for example, uh, becomes kind of the first real president who looks specifically at this. And eventually the populist party just disintegrates, right? Turns into dust and blows away. Um, and you see the political cartoon up here at the top right, right, where uh, William Jennings Bryan is caricaturized and put onto the head of a snake. Uh, the snake says populist party on it, and it's devouring uh, a donkey, the symbol of the Democratic Party. Okay, so basically saying that Bryan is, is overwhelming the Democratic Party with populist ideas and that he is actually sabotaging it in the process. But once McKinley is actually put into the presidency, all the promises that he makes about returning America to a gold standard somehow, just in the nick of time, uh, get fulfilled. In 1897, um, there are discoveries of several gold deposits in South Africa, in Canada, and in Alaska that are all willing to do business with America and send a greater gold supply to America. Okay? And so now, America is able to climb out of the depression it's been in, and McKinley is able to fulfill his promise. Again, just in the nick of time. This is just uh, seems like some kind of miracle that has happened here. And in 1900, McKinley officially signs a bill affirming that America is committed to a gold standard again. Okay, so it takes us, um, takes us a, another decade or two before we actually begin to produce um, the dollar bills that you start to see so often today.